you ever think that your choice of mouse strain could completely change the outcome of your study? Genetically engineered mice are commonly used to follow up on human genome-wide association studies and to test potential candidate genes. Phenotypic and biological studies done in mouse models form the very basis of our understanding of disease biology. Inbred strains are often used to establish the presence, absence, and severity of the phenotype when a particular gene is mutated. The conclusions from these studies are predicated on the assumption that they would generalize to humans, and that presupposes that they would at least generalize to other inbred mouse strains. But what if we change the genetic context? We've known for over a hundred years that the effects of naturally occurring mutations depend heavily on the genetic context in which they're expressed. We wanted to look at null allele effects on many genetic backgrounds, but we didn't want to back cross existing mutations onto multiple strains because this is relatively inefficient. Also, we didn't want to edit the genome of many strains independently because this could introduce off-target effects that could have confounded our analysis. To efficiently express mutations on many different genetic backgrounds, we bred heterozygous mutant males on a C57 black 6J background to females from 30 different inbred lab strains. This produced 30 distinct F1 crosses, where half the mice in each cross had one copy of the null allele and half were wild type. We used this design to generate two independent cohorts of mice, one with a CAC-NA1C null allele and one with a TCF7L2 null allele. Mice were then tested for a variety of behavioral and physiological traits. We used linear models to estimate the phenotypic variance explained by key factors in our experimental design. Genotype of the null allele, genetic background or strain, sex, and the interaction between these factors. We use the interaction between genotype and strain as an index of the generalizability of the null allele's effects. Surprisingly, the majority of phenotypes we measured showed trending to very strong genotype by strain interactions. Aside from the statistical significance of genotype by strain interactions, the data from different strains frequently supported very different conclusions. Often, there were very strong effects in some strains, while others showed complete resistance to the same effect of the null allele. In several cases, the same allele had opposite effects in different strains. For example, TCF7L2 haploinsufficiency increased acoustic startle response in several strains, but decreased it in several others. Very cool results, Laura. Our findings challenge the reductionist view that mutant alleles have a specific phenotype that can readily be determined using a single inbred strain. So what can we do to fix this problem? Unfortunately, there's no easy solutions. Ideally, every mutation would be studied on multiple different inbred backgrounds. In some instances, dominant alleles can be studied on multiple different F1 backgrounds, similar to the approach that we used in our study. Although C57 black 6 is the most commonly used inbred strain, there's no particular reason to think that it's the most appropriate to use when characterizing the effect of a mutant allele. One of the really interesting things about our results is that the interactions with genetic background were much stronger and more prevalent than the interactions with sex. None of our results negate the enormous contributions that model organisms have made to our understanding of biology. It's important to recognize genetic background as a source of non-replication and non-generalizability, similar to the awareness that environment and sex are important biological variables. That's not really good to me. It felt good to me too.